Welcome to Practical AI. If you work in artificial intelligence, aspire to, or are curious how AI-related technologies are changing the world, this is the show for you. Thank you to our partners at Fastly for shipping all of our pods super fast to wherever you listen. Check them out at Fastly.com. And to our friends at Fly, deploy your app servers and database close to your users. No ops required. Learn more at fly.io. Welcome to another episode of Practical AI. This is Daniel Whitenack. I'm a data scientist and founder at Prediction Guard. And I am really excited today because uh, my my life has been filled with large language models for, for the past months, and I feel inundated with information about those. But there's so much going on, uh, so many amazing things happening in the AI world outside of the text modality. And today we have with us Gabrielle Ortiz, who is Principal Geospatial Information Officer at the government of Cantabria in Spain. Welcome, Gabrielle. How's it going? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on and giving me the opportunity to share with you and the audience what we have been up to in the last few years regarding geospatial analysis and particularly artificial intelligence. Yeah, and one of the things that stood out when when we started talking, well, first of all, you're you're a listener of the show, so I love it that you yeah. now get to be a guest on the show. Um, that's so wonderful. I'm I'm glad that we have listeners who are doing amazing things as practitioners. But also, uh, you're you're in Spain, which is is one of my favorite places. I did my collaborators during my grad school days were in San Sebastian, and I spent time there. And I know there's so much innovation happening in that region and in Spain in particular. What's it like to be working in AI in Spain? Well, Spain is, I think, is a great country to find professionals in all the branches of engineering and. Uh, there are many things happening in the AI industry. There is a lot of a good, uh, um, you know, environment of startups uh, growing, and uh, I really encourage uh, you to engage and, and contract people from Spain. Yeah, that's that's so great. And not only is there amazing work going on there, but it's one of the most beautiful places I've I've been. And even when you logged in, so our listeners can't see it, but. I see the beautiful sunshine and trees and and town behind you through your window. So I'm I'm a little bit jealous. <laughs> yeah. uh, you mentioned San Sebastian. I am uh, pretty close to San Sebastian. Santander is a really really uh, beautiful city. Yeah, yeah. So we mentioned that you work in geospatial. I know. So I've been on the Mapscaping podcast a, a few times, which has been has been fun. And I know that that industry is really wrestling with kind of uses of deep learning, uses of AI and understanding how to integrate that into workflows. If my understanding is right, you didn't come from a data science researcher sort of background into this topic. You came more from the geospatial side. So could you tell us a little bit about how, as a geospatial practitioner, you first started kind of dipping your toes into deep learning and understanding what it meant for, for your industry? Sure. I have been working in the special industry for more than 30 years. I started working for topographic control, bathymetric control of works. Uh, then I move on uh, to engineering companies designing highways and railroads, uh, dealing with uh, environmental data, and always using uh, GIS, uh, which stands for Geographical Information System. And you, as many of you know, it's a technology that lets you operate and do analysis to, uh, over a huge amount of data. Then I started to work for uh, Government de Cantabria. I am now uh, in the role of Principal Geospatial uh, Officer, as, as you mentioned. But literally, if you translate directly from Spanish, it would be something like Chief of the uh, Service of Cartography and GIS. My role here is not only being in charge of the data production, but also in the development of the uh, infrastructure for the analysis of geospatial 
geospatial data within our organization. It means for our staff, but also for our stakeholders outside, which is something very important for us, for the citizenship, for the community, and for the companies that are working with geospatial data. Me and my team, we have something uh, very ingrained in our DNA, which is the, the public service that we provide using AI and using another set of technologies. And we every day try to do our best uh, to fulfill with that uh, target. Yeah, it's really, really inspiring to hear kind of the motivations behind how you think about doing your work and, and the people you're serving, which is so great. I'm wondering just practically, you mentioned kind of GIS tooling and, you know, the processing of data in that space. Of course, deep learning and the AI space has its own sort of unique tooling um, and sometimes weird <laughs> tooling. So I'm wondering, could you comment in terms of what is it like for a geospatial practitioner to start adopting deep learning techniques and all of that, which I'm assuming have a different set of tools than geospatial people have used in the past. So what is the current state of, you know, the tooling around mixing deep learning with geospatial? Um, is it difficult? Is it fairly segmented or, or is it more integrated at this point? Well, at first sight, it seems daunting and uh, intimidating, but I have to say that it is not so difficult, right? Just to demystify it a little bit, uh, the AI technology. As you mentioned before, I am not a researcher on AI. I am an expert in geospatial industry. And I will tell you my story, how I began my first, you know, uh, contact or at least at least the first time that I pay attention to AI was in 2012 with AlexNet, what happened in the ImageNet challenge. At that point in time, classification of, of images was uh, great, but it was not very applicable to the geospatial industry. You know, it has an application and you can leverage that, but it's not what we do every day. Previous to that, I have to say that it was in 2010 or 2011, something like that, I knew about the work of NVIDIA with the GP, GPUs, the general purpose GPUs. I think Bill Daly talked talk about this in one of your early episodes. And that was very interesting for me because in the geospatial industry, we often have a lot of uh, demanding in terms of computing power. When we operate with uh, what we call raster data, which is no more than uh, data organized in a, in a grid, topologically in a grid, for instance, an, an image is, is raster data, but also, for example, uh, a digital terrain model, which is a uh, grid where you uh, store it in, in every pixel in the center of every cell, the value of the altitude of the terrain over the main sea level, for example. And you perform calculations over that uh, digital models. For instance, uh, you know, getting the watershed uh, or the view shed of one part of the territory. And that calculations can span for several days or even weeks because in spite that the mathematics underlying running under the hood are not very complex, what happens is that you have so many pixels that uh, it ends up being very demanding. And what uh, NVIDIA uh, started to do on those days was to be able to parallelize uh, a lot of calculations. And instead of using four computational threads on, on your GPU or eight computational threads, they were able to uh, spread all the calculations uh, among uh, hundreds or even thousands of computational threads. That caught my eye because it was very important for me. But at that point in time, I thought, you are going to need, Gabriel, you are going to need a, a GPU, but not for artificial intelligence. I was not thinking about that, but for uh, calculations of, of a different nature. Then in 2015, 2016, witnessed uh, the blossom of uh, a whole new generation of the model architectures. Just to mention some of those who had a big impact in computer vision, ResNet in 2015, I think it was presented in 2016, I, I'm not very sure. Uh, then UNET that has been extensively used. In 2017, the Facebook Artificial Intelligence Research Group presented and proposed uh, mask RCNN. Uh, you know, it, it was an evolution of, of fast RCNN. 
And in 2018, I saw for the first time a demo within the geospatial uh, realm uh, of our data provider, which is Esri, actually. I think you also have a couple of guys from Esri in a previous episode. And what they were demonstrating is how you can detect swimming pools and oil rigs uh, automatically uh, using a single shot detector in that uh, days. And that was kind of, of an aha moment for me because I realized, well, you have to invest your time. Uh, this is going to be definitely a game changer and you have to start working on this. So that was the moment. And from that point, you know, there are two kinds of, of persons. Uh, I will use a metaphor to explain that. When you see the results of AI, some people think it's magic and everybody likes magic, magicians, you know? Some people end up falling in love with the magician. You know, they are obsessed with the persona and the, the mystery and, and the whole stick. But some other people just want how the trick is done. And I think I belong to the second group. So it was not uh, only that uh, this looks like my, it's uh, many, the point was how this is done. And from that point, I started to work. We can delve into it, this uh, if you want. But it's not so difficult, as, as I said before. Yeah, that's so great. Yeah, I think um, I applaud you for digging in and, um, you know, not too early where it was only a research topic, but as it started getting into practical applications, you really took that and, and figured out how to apply it within within your context appropriately, which I think is maybe not not everybody takes that approach so I, I appreciate that so with the tooling that that you're using I think maybe this is useful for people that haven't done geospatial as much so I know there's major tools like uh, ArcGIS and and other ones and then you've got sort of like Jupyter notebooks where you yeah. you know train models or or GPU services where you can run inference and other things have those merged at all so like from within the tooling that you're using as a GIS professional has some of the deep learning tooling been integrated into those tools or is it mostly at this point for you oh, I'm going to export my data from the geospatial side and then you use a notebook and then import it back in or something like that? Well, that's a smart question. Uh, as I said before, uh, our software provider is Esri. Uh, we work with Esri for a number of years and they are doing an excellent job in integrating many open source uh, frameworks into their platform. And uh, I think uh, because we try to follow the literature, but, but we are constantly falling behind, you know, it's extremely difficult every week. Me too. Every month. <laughs> it's <laughs> impossible. And even, uh, you know, uh, constructing, uh, completing the puzzle and the ISO of installing all the frameworks and, and putting it, everything into work can be very complex. So we have a big advantage working with uh, the S3 technology. They have a, a team, research and development team uh, based in India. And I think uh, this people is doing a great job facilitating the application of that. In the in some of your previous episodes, you have been talking about UX um, interfaces for using artificial intelligence, whether or not it has it makes a difference, and it really makes because it's a way of you know uh, democratizing and making accessible the technology. That is one part of the story. I think. It has uh, facilitated a lot our work because you not only need the frameworks, you need uh, all the platform to move across terabytes of data. Your, your spatial industry is highly demanding in terms of the data that you have to work. And it's not only the, the frameworks of open source, it's how you prepare the labeling, how you structure the databases, how there is a lot of more science. And also, uh, apart from that, uh, what I did is starting to gain the main concepts uh, related with artificial intelligence from all the great resources that are completely free on the internet. You know, on YouTube, you have lessons from the MIT, from Stanford, that can introduce you to the simplest concepts, such as a perceptron or a map propagation or a stochastic gradient descent. So I 
designed for myself a twofold strategy. First, trying to gain experience uh, on with uh, getting hands-on on uh, of the shelf models, but at the same time, trying to also learn about the concepts uh, underlying pinpointing the, the AI world. I think that's important. Many people think that artificial intelligence is a black box. It's not a black box. It's mathematical, mathematics in, in action. Uh, of course, it's not linear. You, you cannot fully predict what is going on, but many of the things can be uh, understood. Well, I, I love your perspective, Gabrielle, on how, your, how you've developed a mental model of how these technologies work. I think that's an encouragement to others to both explore these technologies, but also keep in mind what they are and how they should interact with them as, as tools. But I, I'm so fascinated by some of the projects that you've, you've been able to accomplish during, uh, during your time using this technology. And I, I want to start diving into those a little bit. One of the ones that you pointed me to that was really fascinating reminded me of standing on the, the beach in, in yeah, San Sebastian. <laughs> Although it looks like you have really maybe more, more nice beaches up where you're at. So tell us a little bit about how standing on beaches and counting people on beaches, why, why is that important? And how did you get into this project of applying deep learning in that context? Yeah, definitely. I started working um, with deep learning uh, at the end. I think it was the end of 2019 or something like that. Then came the pandemic. And after the pandemic, you know, with the release of restrictions, somebody here at Government of Cantabria say, said, hey, we are a little bit worried about the possibility of having uncontrolled crowds on the beaches because uh, I have to say that Cantabria is a notable tourist destination. We have more than 100 beaches so you can have a, a big problem in terms of spreading of the of the COVID-19 and they were worried uh, the first thing that they asked to me is how can we uh, get uh, a calculation of how many people we have uh, in every beach and uh, we, when the tide is up and when the tide is down and things like that but it was just a simple calculation in terms of the surface or the area that uh, the, the beach has. And I said, I think I can go further and I will count the people. And they said, what? Are you crazy? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm not drunk. I think I can do it uh, because I had uh, some experience using single cell detectors and at that point in time, more models than single cell detectors. And is what uh, we did. Uh, we started counting the people because normally we have an archive of aerial uh, you know, surveys conducted always as is normal in uh, clear skies, sunny days when everybody is on the beach in summer. So we had very well the behavior of use of every uh, spatial behavior of use of every beach all across Cantabria at different days, different months, different, no matter if it is a weekend or of a labor day, we had a huge amount of data to analyze. And uh, we developed some deep learning models uh, that even if you are changing the input signal, that means changing the, the, the aerial survey, it works. We could predict uh, the sectors of every beach, not only in terms of absolute figures of, of population in a beach, but which are the sectors where, where the people try to concentrate. And after that, we released a, a small application that you can uh, see in the notes of the podcast when you can uh, uh, see some maps. And if you, just for curious interest, if you want to uh, place I want to go to a to a beach that, and I want to stay quiet and loosey goosey, you know, without many disturbances. You can see what places are the most suitable for that use. Uh, so it, it was a great experience, our first experience releasing something. Yeah, that's so fascinating, and it, it makes so much sense after you say it. I know 
here, I, I can think of so many more applications for something like this. I know like in the in the US national parks, you know, thinking about crowding and the impact on the natural environment or, or other things like that and helping plan out for crowds at certain points of the year. There's there's so much practical use of this. And this was amazing because yeah, you took this knowledge that you had been building up and really applied it in the moment during COVID nineteen when there was this specific need, but then it sounds like there's continued usage past that because even if I'm just a consumer, like I'm a normal citizen and I want to enjoy the beaches, this information is really useful to me. I, I know myself, I probably would go to the quiet places of the beach and, yeah. and sit and listen to the, to the waves. So that's... Um, there are much more interesting uh, problems to try to solve than... Uh, the one that I described yeah. now. Later, we started to work uh, trying to uh, modelize uh, or to model certain aspects of how the territory works. You have to understand the territory as a whole, as a living entity which, uh, where everything is related to everything. So we started to slice every variable and try to address those variables with uh, the help of AI. For example, we have developed some interesting models. We can delve into the, you know, the architectures you want uh, used later on or whatever you have interested in. But uh, some interesting models for detecting and classifying vegetation, also for the evolution of urban growth, also for things like weird, like tracking cars, for example, that is like a kind of proxy of the society, how the society moves. And because everything is on our aerial surveys, you only have to have the skills to bring back that information and convert it in something useful. And we have been, uh, as the years went by, we have been able to produce some uh, more relevant uh, results. I will not talk about deep learning models, but uh, about solutions yeah. for tracking the territory. Yeah, and you've mentioned um, aerial surveys a couple times. It may be useful for those in our audience who don't work in geospatial. They might have in their mind maps and things like Google Maps where, oh, I could go and I could look at a satellite image, but it's not current, right? It's maybe one photo that was taken some while back. And, and you've talked about aerial surveys where you can actually learn you know, both current information about what's going on in an area, but also historical information. Could you just help our audience understand, like as a professional, what what sort of data do you have access to and how is that gathered practically and made available to you? Well, I have to say that everything that I have been talking about can be also executed with satellite images, you know. Uh -huh. uh, there are some differences, but uh, of course, you can do it with satellite images. The reason that uh, we work more with aerial surveys is because uh, we are more focused on uh, capturing this kind of uh, information rather than working with satellite data. My region, uh, Cantabria, is not very big and we have in Spain a, a national plan that covers every uh, three years all the, the country with aerial uh, surveys and also we have a repository of satellite images. So anyway, you can do both of the input signals. Uh, the results will differ slightly but apart from image capture with a sensor, uh, no matter if it is airborne or satellite uh, sensor. We also work with a range of technologies. For example, uh, LiDAR data. I know that uh, many of the audience uh, have been working with LiDAR data. LiDAR can be also airborne. Uh, in fact, it, it was the, the, the origin of the technology, LiDAR using from a plane, you know. And um, it has been uh, increasingly important in our domain. We also work with, uh, you know, a system of records with traditional databases and um, a number of things. If I had to say something about my job is that is extremely uh, interesting because one day we are working with uh, COVID data, for example. Another day you are working with uh, 
uh, energy data, another work with environmental data. The government of Cantabria has uh, powers and duties in many domains. It's kind of uh, one of your states, uh, if you um, forget the difference of, uh, of area cover, only Texas or, or Florida, I think Spain is in the middle between the, the area of Texas uh, and Florida is something in between, but, but the whole country and my region is, is quite small. But it's a very interesting place uh, to work with uh, because of that reason. And the data comes from many different technologies and many different uh, databases. This is a Changelog news break. Open Observe is a cloud-native observability platform built specifically for logs, metrics, traces, and analytics designed to work at petabyte scale. Huge! According to its creators, quote, It's very simple and easy to operate as opposed to Elasticsearch, which requires a couple dozen knobs to understand and tune. With Open Observe, you can get up and running in under two minutes. It's a drop-in replacement for Elasticsearch if you're just ingesting data using APIs and searching using Kibana. Kibana is not supported nor required with OpenObserve. OpenObserve provides its own UI, which does not require separate installation, unlike Kibana. End quote. An interesting offering indeed. Here's a couple choice quotes from the comment section. User get to the Chapa says, quote, I just tried this three days ago. As someone running a home lab and hadn't set up logging yet, it was a great find. I didn't have to learn and combine three plus log technologies. It's just a single all-in-one monitoring server with web UI, dashboards, log, filtering slash search, etc. RAM usage of the Docker container was under 100 megabytes, end quote. And user SurgeAx says, quote, interesting product, thank you for the effort. Definitely want to give it a try. For me though, Setting up a system is not the primary pain point today. For what it's worth, signing up for a cloud service is not hard. The problem starts at the ingestion point." End quote. You just heard one of our five top stories from Monday's Changelog News. Subscribe to the podcast to get all of the week's top stories and pop your email address in at changelog.com news to also receive our free companion email with even more developer news worth your attention. Once again, that's changelog.com slash news. So, Gabrielle, uh, we talked a bit about this kind of first project of related to population and crowding on beaches, but you've done so much more. Could you highlight a few of these things in terms of other, other things you've been able to identify or track with deep learning from these aerial surveys? Well, yeah, uh, we have uh, an extensive work in the detection of uh, vegetation. I have to say that we have been also only using uh, supervised learning, that branch of the deep learning, and uh, specifically working with different model architectures, uh, such as uh, I mentioned before, UNET, uh, you know, MASCAR, CNN, and some others. Now we are testing now some segment anything model, but we have haven't done anything with uh, zero-shot learning for production. So what I am going to tell uh, has been achieved using model architectures that have uh, been almost forgotten for the community. You know, everybody is focused on the SODA architectures, and there are so much that can be extracted from the old uh, school of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Quote, unquote, it's not so old, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, and I think actually... This is maybe a misconception of people that occasionally we try to mention this on the show. The majority of applications across enterprise, not just in GIS, but in manufacturing or marketing, even um, people think of marketing with generative AI. But the majority of applications are still traditional, quote, traditional <laughs> machine <laughs> learning. You know, there's a lot of scikit learn models out there still, or there's just supervised learning, you know, models uh, out there. And um, yeah, it's awesome to see, to highlight that here, because I think it is a misconception. Yeah, because, you know, the, when a paper appears, normally they do not run out the possibilities of the model. The professionals who are not 
very specialist in the AI domain, but are, have uh, a lot of knowledge in a specific domain out of AI, in my case, we can prepare and curate better labels. We can understand the process that we are trying to model. And we, can, uh, we have so much to give uh, and to propose to the to the community and that's one of the reasons that some people have said that your models are quite good how have you done it is a brand new architecture is something that you have created on your own and always say no it is not it's just uh, using in a smart way model architectures proposed back in 2015 2016 but with uh, a lot of data very well created i also have to say say that the computer power that we have at our disposal is quite modest. We don't have from that point uh, something, uh, you know, uh, big or, or, or very extensive. And the key is how do you create the data? Yeah. And one of the things that you had mentioned prior to recording was this idea of automated cartography as kind of an integration of a bunch of these different models that that you've been working on. I'm wondering if you could kind of first describe what do you mean by automated cartography and maybe even for people that aren't familiar with what, what is cartography and um, you know I'm, I'm assuming ca modern cartography isn't like you know Magellan Getting on his paper and draw, drawing on uh, drawing you know maps on parchment paper or something. But what what does cartography look like these days? And then what do you mean by sort of automated cartography with these sorts of models? Well, cartography is the art and the science of uh, you know trying to model the reality and abstract the reality and plot it in a flat surface. It's a science that has been developing for a number of centuries, uh, from you know many centuries, and uh, up until now it was highly dependent on uh, the human you know ability to to trace and and to uh, you know to draw everything on the surface of the earth. As the technology has been developed from the 90s, we started to move very rapidly into digital technologies. And the automation of the cartography has taken place not only with the advent of AI, but uh, several decades before. However, this is a revolution because we have never been able to, is to produce high such a degree of quality uh, using so few people working. There are some similar technologies like remote sensing, which is the, the part of the technology uh, in charge of uh, analyzing from imagery of satellites and, you know, producing uh, cartography also. You know, it recalls uh, many things of the artificial intelligence, but it can match the results in many other fields. So the revolution continues. Uh, it started, as, as I said before, in the 80s, uh, 90s, uh, but now is a complete revolution. And I think that for the first time we are able, we have an example that you can check it out in, in, the, in the description of the podcast, but where we have been able to produce uh, a map with a basic coverage where you have trees, where you have uh, shrub, where you have uh, no vegetation, where you have uh, buildings uh, or uh, roads or railroads completely uh, uh, generated by AI. Of course, it has uh, some mistakes, but we left on purpose uh, those mistakes on purpose because we wanted that the rest of the community could evaluate the capacity and the ability of the models to, to work alone. This is a question that just popped into my mind as you were talking about the, these models, what's possible, and you know, it's not perfect, right? No AI system is perfect, so there's going to be mistakes. I'm wondering, as someone who's been in GIS and and been a practitioner for, I think you said 30 years now, I also imagine that human-based processes are error-prone, or at least they're slow, right? So by the time a human maybe processes a certain map or something, things have been updated, right? And it's maybe not current anymore. What do you think about the, what are the implications for maybe cartography or GIS as we move to the future where AI systems maybe can do things more up to date, but with some mistakes, 
but they're they're up to date and can really maybe highlight certain areas that are incomplete or something combined with human efforts to correct those mistakes and keep the what, what do you see as this balance between trying to be automated with with AI based techniques and the role with that uh, human cartographers or GIS professionals play as these systems expand to more and more places? Yes, uh, it's, it's a very interesting question because, uh, you know, one of the big problems that we have is to maintain up to date uh, the, every single database that we release into the market or for our stakeholders. That's a very big problem because, uh, it's always difficult. And one of the main uh, advantages of artificial intelligence is that you can have a model and you know it will not probably work perfectly with the next area survey because it will have some differences in terms of colors or shadows or whatever, but you can fine tune, uh, you can, uh, or maybe you can train the model uh, from scratch again, start from scratch with the training and you can update something in a, in a reasonable time uh, frame. So that is one of the things that I uh, most attracted by uh, the capacity of updating things. And it's a game changer, as I said before. Uh, no, uh, no other artificial intelligence offers things that other technologies really don't. Yeah. And of course, there's limitations. Y you know, AI is never, the expectation should never be that it solves all of our issues, but it also should be that it, you know, it's going to solve some of our issues or solve some of our problems, but not all of them. From your perspective, how do you think about the current limitations of AI within GIS and cartography? What are some of the things on, on your mind with respect to that? Uh, yeah, I think, of course, you have to bear in mind that you, we have limitations. Uh, what happens to me also happens in teams in India or in the US that I am always uh, seeing what they are doing. I would like to point out two limitations. One is the computing power and uh, Another thing is the limitations of uh, CNS, which is the technology that we are using right now, convolutional neural networks, right? Uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, model architectures and, and things. In terms of computing power, I think it's worth uh, delving into the role of uh, GPUs because, because in the geospatial realm, it's not well understood why do we need a GPU. And... Uh, is something, I don't know if it happens in other uh, markets, but in our industry, when you talk to somebody about a GPU, normally my fellows and, and mates, I don't know, they, they try to, to say it's something related with the IT department. I don't want to be in charge of that, but it's not at all. You have to be aware of what technology do you have for calculation. The hardware is so important and you have to speak the same language as a data scientist uh, that uh, the rest of the community uh, speaks. And um, that is very, very important to understand that it's not the same a GPU uh, in your laptop, that DGX, uh, uh, talking about the, or uh, HC100, if we are talking about the NVIDIA hardware, it's not the same. And it's everything related with the amount of data that you want to put into the train. You know, the quality of your training, uh, the level of the convergence that you are going to get if you are going to stay in a local minimum in the convergence or you are going to uh, reach and exhaust the possibility of the label that you are ingesting into the model, everything is related with the hardware. I think that Bill Daly and uh, Anim and Anand Kumar in many of their talks always uh, talk about the trinity of AI. Uh, one of them is, uh, you know, the data. Or another is the, the, the software, the algorithms that many of them have been with us for a while. But propagation, you know, uh, many of those algorithms have been from the 80s, if not before, but the hardware is the third part. Bill Daly always says that it's the spike that starts this engine of creativity of AI, and a thing is true. You have to pay a lot of attention to computer power, and there is a lot of, another limitation that is ingrained in the DNA of the CNNs. As far as I know from my experience, 
you cannot expect to perform exactly as a human being. And sometimes, in spite that you create very well your labels and your chips and your data, the model do not learn as good as you expect. But somewhere in between, you can have, you can have a reasonable amount of success in that. What we do to overcome is, you know, combining different uh, model architectures is something very useful and, and widespread in the geospatial industry. For instance, we combine models at two different levels. From the architectural levels, it's quite common to see the combination of uh, ResNet uh, with, for example, UNET. In ResNet, you re remove the last part, the fully connected layers, and connect uh, the remaining part with UNET. So you are using ResNet as a feature extraction for feature extraction, and then the rest of the decoder happens uh, during the, the rest of the UNET architecture. It also happens with mass our CNN, we use constantly ResNet as a backbone, but then the rest of the model goes. And there is a second uh, point, which is combining the results of or, or the inference. When you have uh, inference from two different uh, model architectures, um, for example, talking about vegetation, imagine that you have one model that detects very well the big uh, areas of vegetation, but fails in the small spots. And you have another model that uh, works very well for a small spot, uh, a spots, but fails detecting the, the big areas because uh, in the big areas creates artificial holes and, and, you know, mistakes. You can combine the results of the outcomes of those uh, model architectures with traditional GIS techniques to uh, mesh all the, the, the results together and obtain a bigger, uh, a best quality of the layer that you, you want to infer. That has worked for me and uh, it's one of the ways that we are trying to overcome the, the limitations of artificial intelligence. That's great. Super practical. And I, I know that's what a lot of our listeners want to hear is some of the practical ways they can explore these technologies. Well, Gabrielle, it's, it's been a, an amazing pleasure to talk to you as we close out here. There's a million things we could talk about. I know some we, we didn't get to and we'll link in the show notes. But as you look to the future, could you just briefly in the last uh, uh, minute or so, just briefly share with us what what's exciting for you as a GIS professional looking to the future um, that either you want to dig into next or what, what are you encouraged by or optimistic about as you look to the future of your own work um, and how AI influences that? Well, I have to say that in my 30 years plus of working in the geospatial industry, these two last years, two or so, have been the most exciting part of my career because it's so creative. This We are just scratching the surface of AI and great things are coming. I think uh, that uh, with the advent of Zero Shot, we have been uh, watching from the first uh, week of April what can be done with the SAM, the segment anything model. And I'm sure that new versions will come uh, of uh, future versions of SAM when we combine that with LLM with large language models and we can interact with the boys and say, hey, draw me all the trees in the image or it will be much easier to use this set of technologies. Anyway, uh, I, just to finish, uh, I would like to send a message to the audience for those who are not uh, artificial intelligence researchers like me that uh, it's possible to uh, apply this set of technologies even though you are not a specialist on that that specific domain is also to get hands on on one of the, take one of the shelf uh, models and start uh, playing around uh, with them and uh, i know the future uh, will be absolutely uh, focused on artificial intelligence there will be a, a different uh, geography in the in the next few de decades awesome yeah this is so inspiring thank you for your work gabrielle and uh, it was awesome to have you on the show thank you so much thank you Thank you for listening to Practical AI. Your next step is to subscribe now, if you haven't already. And if you're a longtime listener of the show, 
Help us reach more people by sharing Practical AI with your friends and colleagues. Thanks once again to Fastly and Fly for partnering with us to bring you all ChangeLog podcasts. Check out what they're up to at Fastly.com and Fly.io. And to our beat freaking residents, Breakmaster Cylinder, for continuously cranking out the best beats in the biz. That's all for now. We'll talk to you again next time.